Imagine you own some land. It's belonged to your family for 150 years. It's potentially worth over $30 million. You've got big plans for it. Well, at least you did, until you get a call from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You see, sir, your land used to be a habitat for the dusky gopher frog. Now, nobody's seen the frog in your state in over 50 years, that's true. But it could hypothetically be a habitat for the little fella. All you'd have to do is rip up every tree across 1,500 acres of your property, replace all of it with a very specific tree that doesn't grow there anymore, ensure that there are ephemeral ponds that dry up seasonally, ensure that those ponds don't have any fish that'll feed on the frog's eggs, do controlled burns a few times a year, and presto, it's habitable. Of course, by this standard, here's a mock-up of potential habitat for the dusky gopher frog. If this sounds ridiculous, that's because it is. But this is what happened to Ed Poitivant in 2012. His family has owned attractive land in Louisiana for over 150 years. He sees it as a family heirloom of sorts, something to pass on to his children. The land could be worth over $30 million, if developed. Because of the critical habitat designation, the point events can't do much with the land without triggering a complicated and burdensome consultation process with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. They can't do anything that would require a federal permit, which, in Ed's case, could apply to just shoveling dirt. Almost anything that's done on this land is likely to require a Clean Water Act permit. Just moving dirt around in an area that the Army Corps decides to call a water of the United States can trigger federal liability and a federal permit. And that's the hook. Conservation work is so challenging because the dusky gopher frog needs a very specific landscape to thrive. Ephemeral ponds, open canopy forests, and periodic fires to rejuvenate the grasses. And even then, it's unclear that it would thrive. And here's why. This is the Nature Conservancy in Old Fort Bayou, Mississippi, a hundred miles east of Ed's property. They've been working to recover the frog's population, no small task given its highly specific conditions. The Conservancy took some tadpoles from the existing frog population to raise them in filtrated, aerated aquariums with a steady diet of algae wafers, which, trust me on this, should not be confused with that healthy Trader Joe's snack. At their old Fort Bayou Pond, they've released nearly 3,800 tadpoles and 5,500 metamorphs, which sounds like a Gundam Wing character, but is actually a technical term for frog. The results thus far? Fewer than 50 frogs have survived at their specially designed, exhaustively nurtured site. Now, this is not uncommon result when you're transplanting a species. Even the most ideal circumstances, the frog's ability to thrive is challenging, uncertain, and very, very labor-intensive. What's someone like Ed Poitivant supposed to do? In a case like this, your options are A. Comply with owner's rules and run your very own conservation effort overseen by a federal agency that would quite honestly prefer to take all your land. B. Give up and leave the land as is. Or C. Fight back and sue. Ed opted for C. Pacific Legal Foundation has represented him on the case, free of charge. It's taken six years of litigation and fighting, but it's finally before the Supreme Court. But the case isn't just about Ed's land or a frog that doesn't live there. If a federal agency can do this to the point of on's land, which, remember, the frog does not and cannot live, oh, come on, man. it can designate any piece of land just about anywhere as critical habitat. It's a tough case because we care about protecting endangered species like the dusky gopher frog. Biodiversity is important, but this heavy-handed route does nothing for the frog, and it severely punishes ordinary citizens. So what's a better way of protecting the frog? Tate Watkins, research fellow at the Property Environment Research Center, has some thoughts. The bottom line is that endangered species like the dusky gopher frog don't benefit when the law makes enemies out of landowners. Channeling those resources to on-the-ground recovery efforts like the nature conservancies would actually benefit at-risk species. But a more collaborative approach to dealing with property owners in the first place might make them more receptive to partnering with groups like the Nature Conservancy, and in the long run, that could make a real difference for conservation.